Section 96 was once said to be one of the most vital elements in the Constitution. Do you know what it is about? Do you have any idea of the impacts of that section in the greater scheme of the federal system in Australia? Hello everyone, my name is Renato Costa, this is Aussie Law, and today we will discuss some of the key aspects of section 96 of the Australian Constitution. Section 96 is about the possibility of the Commonwealth giving financial assistance to the states. It says, during a period of 10 years after the establishment of the Commonwealth and thereafter until the Parliament otherwise provides, the Parliament may grant financial assistance to any state on such terms and conditions as the Parliament thinks fit. These are the specific purpose grants. Because these grants exist for the specific purpose of assisting the states in particular situations. This provision exists in the constitution as a financial aid to the states. This is what section 96 is all about. There's this grant that the Commonwealth Parliament can approve and give to the states according to certain terms and conditions that it imposes. The text of the constitution doesn't give much more than that. But, of course, there is way more to this section than just the text of the Constitution entails. So, come with me and let's dissect this section a bit more. Quick and Guerin said that the inclusion of section 96 was supposed to give more flexibility in the Commonwealth state financial relations, especially in light of sections 87, 89 and 93 of the Australian Constitution. We have a video in this channel that explain just a little bit the dynamics that these sections established. Um, you can check this video by clicking on the card that is appearing on your screen. The video is on the case of Victoria and the Commonwealth and Tasmania from 1904. When it comes to the first part of that section, where it says that Parliament will have that power until it provides otherwise, Quick and Guerin say that according to the grammatical implication, it would appear that if the Parliament at any time after 10 years otherwise provides, it cuts away its legislative power under the section altogether, so that the Parliament by passing a law can destroy its own power for the future. So do you think Parliament did it? Do you think that Parliament legislated about these powers to give grants to the states? Of course not! We're way past the first 10 years of the Federation, but Parliament still exercises its powers under Section 96. And will most likely continue to do so, at least until the Constitution lasts. Okay, the section is valid, and the Commonwealth can still use it today to loan some money to the states. But it clearly gives this power for the Commonwealth to give money to the states in the form of a financial assistance. But this leads one to ask, does this mean that the Commonwealth can only use Section 96 as a way to help the states in a case of an emergency? Can these powers only be used for financial assistance, strictly speaking? Well, Quick and Guerin were of that opinion. For them, this is an exception. It is a power not to be used, or as they quoted, it is medicine, not the daily food of the constitution. However, the reality is that this is not what we see today. There is still the role of the Commonwealth using this section to help states in financial stress, but the Commonwealth also uses this power to grant money to the states as a bargaining mechanism. It is a way for the Commonwealth to get involved with state local sector expenditure. That's why these grants are more commonly called tied grants. Because the Commonwealth doesn't really freely give money to help the states. That's not all it does. There are some strings attached. The section does say that Parliament will establish the terms and conditions of the grant as they think fit. The first case to recognize this possibility was Victoria and Commonwealth from 1926, also known as the Federal Roads case. But the full significance of Section 96 was only realized in another case called South Australia and the Commonwealth from 1942, a case also known as the First Uniform Tax Case. 
In this case, the High Court of Australia decided that the Commonwealth can impose any terms and conditions as it thinks fit according to Section 96, but it is up for the states to reject the grant and the conditions if the states are not willing to fulfill the terms and conditions established by the Commonwealth. That is, the tied grants under Section 96 are not necessarily coercive. The states are not forced to accept the money. In some respects, they could be unlawful, that's true. But generally speaking, they work as an inducement to the states to exercise or omit exercising certain powers. Their way in which the Commonwealth can try to induce the states to do something in exchange for money. But again, it's not mandatory for the states to just accept it. If the states do not want to fulfill the terms and conditions, they can just reject the grant. A few years later, in the second uniform tax case, the High Court of Australia once again analyzed the validity of Section 96 of the Constitution and the Commonwealth grants to the states. On that occasion, Chief Justice Dixon said, the power conferred by Section 96 is well exercised, although one, the state is bound to apply money specifically to an object that has been defined. Two, the object is outside the powers of the Commonwealth. Three, the payments are left to the discretion of the Commonwealth Minister. And four, the money is provided as the Commonwealth's contribution to an object for which the state is also to contribute funds. The fact is that since that case in 1926, the Federal Roads case, the Commonwealth has made little use of Section 96. But from 1950s, the Commonwealth started to get financially involved in supporting tertiary education. And then in the early 60s, the Commonwealth started getting involved in financing private primary and secondary education as well. All of that through Section 96. In fact, surveys have shown that the Commonwealth has made grants through Section 96 in many areas that fall within the jurisdiction of the states, most notably education, health, housing, transports and roads. But I will finish the video now by telling you something that a former Commonwealth Solicitor General has said. Five months after the decision in the first uniform tax case, Professor Kenneth Bailey said the following. Constitution that contains Section 96 contains within itself the mechanisms of Commonwealth supremacy. Commonwealth supremacy? Wait, can this be another tool for the Commonwealth to expand its powers? Well, I think this has proven to be the case. Section 96, the tied grants, are a great way for the Commonwealth to influence the states. It can potentially be used, even if limitedly, to undermine states' authority and even direct states' policies and their exercise of their powers. As Lambert Mowens commented, the consequence is that what legally is a fiscal incentive has become a means whereby the Commonwealth has exercised at least a general policy influence on various areas within states' residuary power. Section 96 is indeed a potential mechanism for Commonwealth supremacy. What do you think? Do you agree with that? Leave a comment below. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And don't leave without clicking the like button and subscribing to our channel. I hope to see you again next time. Until then, ciao.